If there was ever a cautionary tale about a rock group making a deal with the devil to hit the big time, it would be the story of the rise and fall of our feature band today. A saga of talent, fame, and excess, followed by violence, frustration, alcoholism, disaster, poverty, and death. Along this bumpy journey, there are a lot of great songs that will make you stand up and cheer. I do want to warn you, it's going to be electric and frantically hectic. Coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you ever pined for a bunch of albums that you didn't have the money to buy when you were younger, you know, at that moment, but you now have them all as an adult, you're going to dig this channel. Make sure that you subscribe below right now and to click the bell so that you are always in the know about our latest interviews. We also have our latest series that's exclusive to Patreon. The link for that is below and you can become an honorary producer to help us uh, curate this music history. The Ballroom Blitz by Sweet, a song that uh, one misguided British music critic called Unabashed Rubbish, was a massive smash with listeners around the world, 1973, and it became an endearing glam rock anthem. Now, before we get into the creation of this incredible track, let's go back to 1967 when singer Brian Connolly and drummer Mick Taylor formed a band called Sweet Shop uh, with bassist Steve Priest and guitarist Frank Torpy. The lads gigged wherever they could around the London scene that was in the late 60s. They quickly lost Torpy and replaced him with Mick Stewart. Producer-songwriters uh, Mike Chapman and Nicky Chin, they discovered Sweet Shop and followed the formula that vaulted the monkeys into pop stardom. Uh, this was by turning the band into a fabricated act that lip-synced to songs that were actually performed by studio musicians. Despite their disdain for being miming puppets, the foursome begrudgingly went along with Chapman and Chin's plan until their first four singles were dismal flops and a reinvention was in order. The band changed their name to The Sweet and convinced their manager that they should be known as a real band, playing their own instruments and establishing an identity. The classic core lineup of The Sweet was set with Brian Connolly doing lead vocals, there was Steve Priest on bass, Mick Taylor on drums, and Andy Scott on lead guitar. Scott was the last player to be added to that core unit after the departure of Mick Stewart. Prior to joining the suite, Scott played with Paul McCartney's younger brother, Mike, in a band that was called The Scaffold. Uh, not only was Scott the final piece to this lineup, he's also the last surviving member of the suite. All four of the guys had day jobs before they had their breakthrough hit. Connolly was a carpet salesman. Scott worked at a bank, and Taylor and Priest were automotive mechanics. The guys quit their day jobs when the band's fifth single, Funny Funny, rose to number 13 on the UK singles chart. That was in 1971. Their next single, the Caribbean-flavored Coco, was even bigger. It climbed all the way to number two. And then came Alexander Graham Bell, that went to number 33, and another tropical island ditty, Papa Joe, that reached number 11 in the UK in 72. But the song that broke the suite in America was their ninth single, the irresistibly catchy Little Willie. That was uh, ultimately the group's highest charting single in the US, it went to number three. A year later, in the fall of 1973, The Sweet, who by then had shortened their name to just Sweet, they hit pay dirt in the States again with their future pop culture classic, The Great, The Ballroom Blitz. The Ballroom Blitz was co-written by Mike Chapman and Nikki Chin, both legendary, um, so many great songs. But the inspiration for this song actually came from Chapman after he witnessed mass hysteria at sweet concerts in Scotland. But they don't care. No, 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 no. It all happened at the Grand Hall Palace Theater in Kilmarnock, Scotland in 1973 while their single Blockbuster perched at number one on the UK singles chart. Oh, 
Men standing in the balcony above the stage spat on the band. And the women in the audience were screaming so loudly from sweet ecstasy, they drowned out what the band was performing on the stage. Uh, the unruly crowd, they hurled bottles on the stage, uh, completely upending the concert and forcing the band to rush off the stage halfway through their set. Chapman himself was terrified by the riot, but he would witness even more shocking chaos at another gig in Scotland that very same year. At the Apollo in Glasgow, a bunch of girls grabbed Connolly and Scott by the ankles. They dragged them off the stage. They cut off pieces of their long locks with scissors that they had hid in their handbags. It was obvious to Chapman that the four musicians of the suite had become rock stars. Uh, they'd passed over that threshold. The term Chapman came up with for the medley of mayhem was the ballroom blitz, capturing the craziness in Scotland with the lyrics, and the man in the back said, everyone attack. And it turned into a ballroom blitz, and the girl in the corner said, boy, I want to warn you, it'll turn into a ballroom blitz. Ballroom blitz. Oh yeah. It was electric, so frantically hectic, and the band started leaving, because they all stopped breathing. And the band started leaving, because they all stopped breathing. Reflecting back on that uh, fateful night in Kilmarnock, uh, the band could only speculate on why that particular crowd was so wild. It could have been the band's appearance with their you know, heavy eyeshadow, their glitter, and their lipstick that may have proven too much for the hard lads at Killy as the city is nicknamed. Uh, or it could have been uh, the result of enraged jealousy from the males in the venue when they saw how uh, you know, the girls in the audience were worked into a frenzy by Brian, Steve, Andy, and Mick. Now, as we further go into this crazy story, there's a lot more here, I do want to recognize our sponsor, Zanny Eyewear. If you're looking for some style going into this summer, new look, you know, whether shades or prescription glasses, Zenny has got you covered. Just go to zenny.com and pick your poison there. You just put in your prescription from there, your address, and they ship them straight to your door. You can see how you look by looking at their mirror feature as well. Check it out today at zenny.com. Now, whatever the reason, when fame found sweet, violence followed. During the sessions for the album Desolation Boulevard that featured the Ballroom Blitz, the U.S. version at least for sh uh, be in the beginning, Brian Connolly was the victim of a vicious attack on High Street in Staines, England. The details of the attack uh, were mixed. Andy Scott claimed that Connolly was trying to protect his Mercedes from a couple of local hoodlums uh, who were stomping on the hood of the car. Steve Priest gave a, a more sinister account, saying that Connolly was the target of a setup job. Uh, according to Priest, Connolly was being told by unknown persons who uh, waited until he parked his car at a pub to buy some cigarettes. Connolly had allegedly angered one of the passengers in the pursuing vehicle by, I guess, flirting with his girlfriend. When Connolly got out of his car, three guys jumped him, striking him repeatedly. One of the attackers kicked Connolly in the throat uh, while he lied on the ground. And uh, Brian actually heard him say, yeah, that should do the job. In an apparent effort to retaliate by smashing Brian's vocal cords. Just dismal. For some reason, the band was secretive about the incident, and they didn't publicize it. They told the press that the reason they had to cancel six months of shows was because you know, Brian had a throat infection. The beating reportedly permanently damaged Connolly's singing ability. Just really sad. It diminished his once effortless vocal range. It also led to the cancellation of support dates with The Who at Charlton Athletics Football Stadium, an invitation that was personally extended by Pete Townsend himself, who was a big Sweet fan. The missed opportunity to open for The Who uh, and to continue on, it was just devastating to the four members of Sweet, who frequently cited The Who as being really one of their main influences, even playing a medley of Who tracks on their live set for a lot of years. To the middle of the night. The ballroom blitz kicks off with Brian Connolly calling out his bandmates. I love this when he says, you know, Steve, Andy, and Mick, and 
And the, the idea for that call out, that was actually Mike Chapman's coming directly from his tape demo of the Ballroom Blitz. A demo that the band hated. Ready, uh -huh. Andy? Yeah. And when Chapman played the tape he'd made for the band, the guys thought it was abysmal. Steve Priest described it as watered down Mark Bolin. Andy Scott said the way that Chapman sang the song sounded like Johnny Cash. I guess that was a, a diss. The things you do to me. Uh. Truthfully, at first, the band and the record producer, Phil Wayman, didn't know what to do with the track. In between band rehearsals, Mick Taylor and Wayman totally revamped the song. And from there, it turned into something really exciting. Their first move was implementing a Sandy Nelson-like drum pattern to give the song instant energy to you know, build around. Nelson, of course, an American musician from Southern California, renowned as one of the best rock drummers of the late 50s and the early 60s. After earning much respect as a session drummer, Nelson performed on several smash hits, including To Know Him Is To Love Him by the Teddy Bears and The Alley Oop by the Hollywood Argyles. Great big monsters dead on their knees. Nelson released an instrumental titled Teen Beat, and it shot to number four on the Billboard Hot 100, and that was in 1959. Now, jumping off from the sped up Sandy Nelson imitation, uh, the overall arrangement mimicked Bobby Comstock's uh, Boogie Woogie Rock track, Let's Stomp. That peaked at number 57 on the Billboard Hot 100. <laughs> The savage rhythm produced by Mick Taylor's drumming and Steve Priest's bass line charged the high voltage endorphins of the Ballroom Blitz, you know, setting up the spirited vocal exchange between Brian Connolly and Steve Priest and, of course, some killer guitar riffs from the great Andy Scott. <laughs> Connolly delivered a seminal vocal on the Ballroom Blitz with support on the high notes from Priest, who also sang two of the most memorable lyrics on the track because she thinks she's the passionate one uh, you know, in the first refrain. And she could kill you with a wink of her eye. That was in the second refrain. Love those, just classic. Part of Priest's vocal was sampled in the Beastie Boys track, Hey Ladies. After the BC Boys sample, the Ballroom Blitz had a resurgence in pop culture. The track was placed in the films Bordello of Blood, Daddy Daycare, and Sandlot, uh, heading home. One of the coolest covers of the Ballroom Blitz was recorded by The Damned. Their punk rock version of the track featured a special guest appearance by Lemmy from Motorhead. Just awesome. <laughs> The Struts recorded a version that was on the soundtrack to the movie The Edge of Seventeen. And then, of course, there was uh, Taya Carrera's uh, memorable performance of the song in Wayne's World. That was very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You may not know this, uh, but director Quentin Tarantino seriously considered using Ballroom Blitz for the disturbing torture scene you know, with Michael Madsen in uh, the movie Reservoir Dogs but he decided to go with Stuck in the Middle with You by Steeler's Will. The Ballroom Blitz exploded to number one in Australia, Canada, Germany, and uh, also Ireland. And the single scaled to number five on the Billboard Hot 100. Should have been a number one. Sweet was much bigger in the UK than they were in the US. I mean, between 71 and 78, Sweet had five top 20 hits in America but they had a whopping 10, 10 top 10 hits on the British singles chart. Now here's an interesting bit of music chart trivia. The Ballroom Blitz has the distinction of being only the second single in UK chart history to enter the survey at number two without reaching number one. The first single to debut at number two in the UK and being denied the top spot was actually Let It Be by the Beatles, if you believe that, that was in 69. words of wisdom, let it be. Yes, Sweet released many great songs over the 70s, including such favorites as Fox on the Run in 75. Fox on the Run. 
followed by Action in the same year. And their last international hit song, Love Is Like Oxygen, in 1978. As time went on, issues between Connolly and other members of Sweet uh, started to heat up, and Brian would find the band excluding him from decisions. The root of the problem was Connolly's growing alcoholism, which came to a head in 1978. Brian's problem with the drink likely stemmed from the demons of his childhood. As an infant, his biological mother, a teenage waitress, abandoned him in a Glasgow hospital. Uh, and this is while he was suffering from meningitis. Very sad. Connolly was fostered at the age of two by Jim and Helen McManus, and he took their family name. Uh, Brian didn't discover his true lineage until he was about 18, and he actually reverted back to Connolly, his surname at birth. The detachment from family, while emotionally painful, seemed to motivate Brian to become a rock star, and he focused on nothing else. There was no plan B. Between March and May 1978, Sweet extensively toured the U.S. as a support act for Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band. Uh, the tour included a disastrous date in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, that was on the 3rd of May, during which uh, visiting Capitol Records executives in the audience saw Brian Connolly give a drunken and uh, really incoherent performance that terminated early in the set with his collapse on the stage. Left the rest of the group to play on uh, without him, unfortunately. The band returned briefly to England before resuming the second leg of their U.S. tour in uh, late May, uh, supporting other acts, there was, uh, they supported uh, Foghat and uh, Alice Cooper as well. Concluding the U.S. tour in early July 1978, Brian's alcoholism and estrangement from the group led to the frontman leaving Sweet. That was in 1979. In 1981, the year that uh, Sweet disbanded, Connolly was rushed to the hospital where he suffered an astonishing 14 heart attacks in less than 24 hours. 14 heart attacks. Doctors notified his ex-wife that if he survived, he would likely have a lot of brain damage. Somehow, though, Brian miraculously survived. Although he didn't experience cognitive brain damage, he was left with slurred speech, uh, partial paralysis, and violent tremors that would shake his arms and legs. Out of the blue in 1988, Mike Chapman contacted the core members of Sweet and offered to reunite the classic lineup and this bankroll recording sessions in L.A. for a brand new Sweet album. Everybody was very excited. Chapman met the guys at LAX. Uh, Andy and Mick came off first, as Chapman recalled. Um, Mike asked the guys, where's Brian? And they said, oh, he's coming. Mike waited for all the passengers to the plane and then out walked what he called uh, this little old man hobbling towards them. It was Brian Connolly. He was walking with a cane and shaking with a ghostly white face. And when they got to the studio, it was immediately clear that Brian could no longer sing, and uh, the reunion plan was sadly aborted. Brian Connolly tried to stay active with several band incarnations, but he spent his last years in poverty, never recovering financially from a delinquent 1.3 million pound tax bill, and he suffered from rapidly declining health. He passed away in 1997. Mick Taylor, one of the, the most underrated drummers to come out of the UK, he died in 2002. Steve Priest, who infamously wore a German military uniform and donned a Hitler mustache during one of Sweet's early appearances on Top of the Pops, he passed just a couple of years ago. Andy Scott, an outstanding guitarist and composer of Sweet's final hit, Love is Like Oxygen, he's the last man standing for the band Sweet. Love is like oxygen. Now, Sweet... Man, they were a major influence on many of the biggest rock acts of the 80s. I mean, Cinderella, Scorpions, Motley Crue, Def Leppard, they all have a, a humongous debt uh, to Sweet. Andy Scott disclosed that in the early 80s, Motley's Nikki Six used to call him at all hours of the night asking him to go to LA to produce Motley Crue, but he hated the band's demos. And in his autobiography, Nikki Six told of the time when he sent some songs he'd written to Brian Connolly, who was one of his idols. Nikki was devastated when Connolly told him his songs were not good, and he had no talent as a songwriter. 
But this criticism fueled determination in Nikki Six to prove Connolly wrong, and he certainly did just that. You know, I discovered Sweet one Saturday afternoon in my dad's shop, his paint shop. Uh, my parents were out of town, so I was looking for something to do. Went into my dad's shop where he worked, you know, vanishing cabinets and such. And I mean, he was a painting contractor, I think I've told you before. But he had this big stereo that was a really big deal in the 70s, but it looked ancient to me in the middle of the 80s. I was just fascinated by it, though. It had an eight track slot and it would light up when it turned on, you know, the little needle would go like. Well, my dad had several cases of eight track cartridges and piles of them all over the shelves, you know, and I saw Desolation Boulevard. I was really intrigued by the cover. So I, I pushed the cartridge into the slot and it started playing Ballroom Blitz. I was so floored by this song. I must have played it like 20 times in a row. And if you remember back then, it took almost as long to rewind the song as it did to listen to it with that old machine. <laughs> I turned the song up as loud as the speakers would go and it was just shaking the shop, you know, paint cans rattling. I was using this push broom as the stand-up microphone. I had this old tennis racket as a guitar. And then I grabbed a can of spray paint and I sprayed sweet all over the floor. Of course, I got in trouble when my dad got back into town, but I think he understood. There are only a few songs that bring out that kind of electricity in a human being. And Ballroom Blitz is at the top of that list. Ballroom Blitz. Ballroom Blitz. Leave us a comment about the Ballroom Blitz by Sweet. What do you remember about this song? What are your memories? Such a phenomenal song. Uh, share with us your, your feelings about all four members. Uh, if you dig our content, make sure that you subscribe below so you never miss out on our videos. It's nostalgia every day. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Make sure to check out our Patreon, our latest merch, both of these things, all of it helps us keep the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.